Having survived the transcendental deduction, we are now ready to embark on the second book of the transcendental analytic, which is called the analytic of principles. Uh, actually, the introduction to this second book, the analytic of principles, gives us a very good reason to revisit the structure of Kant's critique overall. Because here Kant tells us the following, and I'm citing from B169 or A130. General logic is constructed on a plan that corresponds quite precisely with the division of the higher faculties of cognition. These are understanding, the power of judgment and reason. In its analytic, that doctrine accordingly deals with concepts, judgments and inferences corresponding exactly to the functions and the order of those powers of mind which are comprehended under the broad designation of understanding in general. Okay, so Kant is here making this um, partition into three parts of our cognitive powers. It's the understanding, which is the, the power of, of concepts. Then there is the power of judgment, which judges, right? And a judgment is... Um, well, it's like judging that something is true or false, right? A concept would be something like causation or dog, but a judgment would be something like this causes that or that dog is ugly, right? That would be a judgment. And finally, reason, which is in the business of making inferences that is of connecting different judgments together, right? So we have concepts which are which we can think of as the building blocks that are brought together in judgments, and then judgments are connected and brought together in inferences. And this is done by the understanding, the power of judgment, and reason. Now, to confuse things, Kant doesn't always use these terms in this particular way. As he already indicates, there is also a broad designation of understanding in general, which encompasses it all, right? So there is understanding in the broad sense, which is understanding power of judgment and reason together. In fact, Kant also uses, uh, I think, the word reason sometimes in the broad sense to encompass all of this, as one would say in the title of the book, Critique of Pure Reason. Okay, so we need to keep in mind that Kant's terminology isn't always uh, ultra clear in this regard, but here he sets out the, the basic distinction that informs the way that he has set up his book. Because what we did in this first book of the Transcendental Analytic the analytic of concepts uh, was to find out the a priori concepts that are involved in our experience, right? That's what we did. Those were the 12 categories. Now we are moving on to judgments. Basically, we are moving on to the question of what a priori judgments can we make with those concepts? Uh, and of course, we can make a lot of a priori like analytic judgments with those concepts, saying things like, um, if something is real, it is real, or if A causes B, then A causes B. That's not the kind of thing that Kant is interested in. Kant is interested in the synthetic a priori judgments that we can make um, using the categories. And that is what the analytic of principles is going to be about. Then finally, uh, reason, inferences. Well, Kant has something to say about that. He tells us, and this is B170 or A131, he says, it turns out that the transcendental use of reason is not objectively valid at all, thus does not belong to the logic of truth, that is, the analytic, but rather as a logic of illusion requires a special part of the scholastic edifice under the name of the transcendental dialectic. It is something that Kant has said before, and it is something that Kant will say a lot more about later on once we get to the transcendental dialectic, uh, but his claim here is that yeah, we have these categories, which are sort of the, the, the a priori uh, concepts that apply to all experience. Uh, we have a priori judgments. But when reason starts doing it jo its job, once it starts trying to extend those judgments, well, what it's going to do is it's going to try to extend them beyond the bounds of possible experience. Um, that is where like a transcendental use of reason would be happening. And then it invariably, Kant thinks, leads us into trouble, into, uh, into illusion. And so there's a logic of illusion here, which Kant will uh, explain to us 
in the dialectic, and we will look at that much more closely once we get to the dialectic. Okay, but for now, we are in the realm of the power of judgments, right? And that means that we are going to try to use what we have found in the previous part of the book, those 12 categories, and in a sense get some metaphysical truth out of them, uh, at least in the second chapter of the, uh, of the analytical principles. We are going to find these wonderfully named things like the anticipations of perception and the analogies of experience. Uh, and in a sense, those are going to be sort of a bunch of fundamental metaphysical truths. Um, not as much as one might hope for if one is a traditional metaphysician, but definitely nothing to be sneezed at either, as we will see when we get there. So the analytical principles will be a canon for the power of judgments that teaches it to apply to appearances the concepts of the understanding, which contain the condition for rules a priori, right? to experiences, and of course only to experiences. That is how the categories are to be applied. And we are going to find out how and in what sense in the coming pages. So then Kant gives us an introduction on the transcendental power of judgments in general before getting to the two main chapters. There's a very short chapter uh, on the schematism and a very large chapter on, um, how does Kant call it, on the system of all principles of pure understanding. Now, introduction on the transcendental power of judgment in general uh, is a very nice reflection about the power of judgment, where Kant basically says, well, suppose you have a concept, right? And let's take something very concrete, the concept of dog, right? I can, I can, I can read a lot about dogs. I can sort of learn the entire theory of dogs, sort of have a perfect, in a sense, conceptual grasp of dogs. But now when it comes to like meeting animals, Am I going to be able to actually classify dogs correctly? Am I going to be able to say, oh, that's a dog and that's a cat? Well, hopefully I am, but that's, it's, it's in a sense a separate skill, right? And Kant says this about it, which is, which is kind of deep. Um, he says, if I wanted to show, if it wanted to show generally how one ought to subsume under these rules, that is, distinguish whether something stands under them or not, this could not happen except once again through a rule. But just because this is a rule, it would demand another instruction for the power of judgment. And so it becomes clear that although the understanding is certainly capable of being instructed and equipped through rules, the power of judgment is a special talent that cannot be taught, but only practiced. So what Kant is saying, suppose that somebody says, okay, but I, I, I thought I, I understood the concept of dog, um, but I, I seem to misapply it because I say all the time things like, hey, this is a dog, and then someone says, no, that's a bust of Nietzsche. Um, help me, right? H how do I make sure that I apply the rule correctly? Well, I can give a story to someone about how to apply the rule correctly, but it will consist in giving them a rule. Right, maybe the same rule, maybe a slightly different rule or a different phrasing of the same rule, um, but it's always going to involve a rule. So there seems to be something fundamental here, which is the capacity of applying rules. Uh, and we're going to meet this, for instance, like uh, uh, 150 years or so later, um, in somebody like Wittgenstein, who is going to get pretty obsessed about this notion of this ability to follow a rule and, and what it what it means to have the ability to follow a rule and how you could have the ability to follow a rule. It seems to be presupposed um, by everything else, right? It seems to be this, this basic power. And Kant says us some more about it. Um, some of the examples he gives sort of also suggest that this might be very important in a practical or ethical context, right? When we don't take the example of a dog, but maybe the example of, um, of um, I don't know, if you're a judge, um, you're going to have to be able to judge whether somebody is, you know, whether you ought to be merciful or not. Right? What kind of case is this? Is this the kind of case where mercy ought to be applied or the kind of case where you ought to pursue justice to the full extent of the law? Hmm. That, that seems to be the kind of thing that, that you can't be taught. Right? You might through examples come to become better at that 
You might, through reflection, become better at that. You might, as Kant himself says, practice it. Um, but it's not something you can learn from a book. Okay. It's not something you can learn from a book. Now, Kant is going to say much more about judgment in a book called The Critique of the Power of Judgment. Um, but that is neither here nor there. So, finally, at the end of this introductory section, Kant tells us the plan for the next chapters. He tells us that the transcendental doctrine of the power of judgment will contain two chapters. The first, which deals with the sensible condition under which alone pure concepts of the understanding can be employed, that is, with the schematism of the pure understanding. And let's look at the schematism in the next video. And the second, which deals with those synthetic judgments that flow a priori from pure concepts of the understanding under these conditions and ground all other cognitions a priori. That is, with the principles of pure understanding. So the first chapter is going to be a little bit preliminary. It's going to be about the application uh, conditions of, of the categories. And then in the second chapter, the applying or the basic rules for applying uh, are going to be uh, set out. So without further ado, let's move into the schematism chapter.